Amen. I'm glad I get to be here with y'all today. Um, first off, I want to celebrate last weekend. Man, last weekend was a killer weekend. We had baptism weekend, and we had 124 people get baptized last weekend. It was a blast. And, uh, oh, man, and a uh, young girl that I've got to watch grow up, her name is Shawnee, and uh, she was here last weekend, hadn't been in church in a long time, and after the 9 o'clock service, she came up to me, and she said, hi, Lydia, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, Shawnee, and, and uh, she said, I know that guy that was up there said the sinner's prayer, but will you say the sinner's prayer with me, because I know you, and I'm like, absolutely, baby, I will gladly say the sinner's prayer with you, so I got to pray with her. And then um, she said, well, I'm going to be back at 1.30. Will you baptize me? And I said, absolutely, I'll baptize you. And I knew I had to go to the hospital afterwards, so I wasn't going to get it in the pool. But, man, am I glad I got in that pool. Oh, my goodness, it was what an amazing day. And then I got to baptize several people that I get to mentor. And then all of y'all got to baptize a little, several kids. I mean, it was just an amazing day. And then before we got out, I noticed that Pastor Ashley, that her hair was dry. I went, no, 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 she's not getting out of this pool with dry hair. And so uh, we had to make sure that her hair was wet when she got out of the pool. She looks at me and goes, no, 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 it's clean. I'm, well, it won't be when I get done with it. It's going to have chlorine water all in it. And uh, so us and the pastors all had fun splashing each other at the end. Uh, Ryan, one of our council members, he did a cannonball at the end. I mean, we just had, it was a great weekend. And then I want to celebrate my son, Jim. How many got to see him on social media? Oh, my goodness. Uh, I have had the honor of doing about five different playoff games. I actually got to do the game when Kobe Bryant got his MV, M, uh, MVP. And, uh, but Jim has never got to do a playoff game, and he got his first playoff game um, on the sixth game, and he got to sing the national anthem on Friday night. And, oh, my goodness, and I've tried to tell him forever, Jim, I know you've went with me to all the playoff games, but dude, there's nothing like when you get to go out on that, on that court and sing. And uh, so he called me afterwards. He goes, oh my gosh, mom, there is no way you could have ever described that to me. I said, I told you that room's electrified at it. He goes, mom, it was incredible. And mom, I got to sing in front of Adele. Like I sang in front of Adele. He said, and then I went to go out on the court, and Megan asked me, well, the girl that walks us out there, she said, uh, hey, Jim, did you notice who's behind you? And he goes, Mom, I turned around, and Dr. Dre was behind me. And so Dr. Dre is only one of the best uh, uh, music producers there is. And so he was like so jazzed. He said, Mom, it was just an electrified night. And he said, Mom, I went to go out on the court. He said, and I'm standing there, and I thought, you know what? I know this is, because we hum it in our head a hundred times before we go out there. And he said, I know this is the key I do this song in, but I'm going to modulate a key. <laughs> he said, I was feeling it so much, I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it up a key. And oh my gosh, the kid slayed it. So just in case you didn't hear it, y'all know I had to bring it to show it to y'all. So here you go.
my goodness, my goodness. Did y'all see that little fish pump at the end? I went, dude, you did that because you knew you killed it, didn't you? It's, oh man, mom, it was awesome. There is nothing like it. And that has absolutely nothing to do with what we're going to talk about today, but I just had to play it for you. It was just too cool. I'm a proud mama. Oh my goodness, he killed it. All right. Uh, what was I going to say? I was next. Mother's Day. Mother's Day is coming up here in just a few weeks. And if you have a picture of you and your mom you'd like to send in, we're going to do a whole slide projection of you and your moms. And we want to honor our moms, all right? So be sure and send them in. There's a link up there somewhere that'll tell you how to do it. Right there. And then also, our men's getaway is June the 2nd and 3rd. It's going to be up there on the Kern River, close to where me and James live. And uh, if you come in, I'll make you homemade buttermilk biscuits, okay? So y'all got to show up, but you got to show up. So, you got to be there. Be there. I promise you, it's going to be a blast. And that river is crazy right now. <laughs> I just want to tell you, there's water beyond water. It's crazy. But today, we're going to continue our talk that we've been doing over the last few weeks called Project. How many of you will admit along with me that we're all a project? God is working on every single one of us, isn't he? He's making us and developing us and, and helping us to become more and more like his son, Jesus. And that's what the goal is. And uh, we're all a project. God's helping us to heal. And so we, we started off the talk about restore, uh, restoring our confidence that sometimes can get crushed. Anybody else's? Yeah. And then we talked about the healing process. And then last week, Pastor Guy killed it, talking about if I could just change my life. And he showed us how to do exactly that using the Bible. And today we want to build on last week's message. And we want to talk about how to break free from addiction. How do we break free from addiction? You may say, Lydia, well, I don't have addictions. Really? <laughs> yeah. Y'all are in denial. That's what it's called. There's a river named after you. Uh, a good definition is this. The fact or condition of being addicted to a, a particular substance thing or activity. Uh, that's what it means. Top, the top American addictions, this first one is going to be a no duh, is drugs and alcohol, right? Drugs, prescription and non-prescriptions and alcohol. The next one, welcome to the world, Lydia, is food. It has been, it, it has been proven that food for some does the same thing in the brain that are, uh, the, there's the same response in the brain to fat and sugars that addicts have when they do drugs. <laughs> uh, for James Ranger, it's dark chocolate. The man loves dark chocolate. For me, it's a good cheeseburger. <laughs> oh, man, I love me a good cheeseburger. Anybody in the house love a good cheeseburger? Yeah, man, I'm with you. Place make a good cheeseburger, I'm going there. Jim Rangers just like me. Uh, the next thing is gambling. 3% of Americans have a problem. Sex and pornography, 3 to 6% of Americans. Internet and smartphones. Brian Scudamore, I think that's how you say that name writes that the brain on a smartphone is the same as the brain on cocaine. <laughs> we get an instant high every time our screen lights up with a new notification. It's because dopamine, which is the feel-good chemical that's in your brain, is released. You may say, yay, somebody commented on my post. Woohoo! Yeah, I got all these comments or else you're really in a bad mood if nobody comments. And uh, the next thing is work. Some of us are addicted to work. 15 to 25 percent of Americans are addicted to work. And then two of these are hitting me. This last one, how many is with me? Shopping. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I bought these last night at Macy's. They were $45 and I had a $10 coupon, so I got them for $35. So, and believe me, it gives that dopamine chemical to your brain when you get that kind of sale. I just want to say, yeah, yeah, it feels good. And, uh, but there, I have, I, I have several people around here that don't help hold me accountable because they're just as bad as me. I like this. I think there's a meme back there. Please, God, don't let me see any more sales because you know I'm weak. Did it show it? There we go. There we go. Oh, man. Is that not the truth? But I want to tell y'all something since he ain't here to defend himself. Your pastor has an addiction, a bad one, and it is called an addiction to sunflower seeds. <laughs> I'm not even kidding y'all. It started years ago with him trying to replace chips and salsa because a man loves chips and salsa. And so, he wanted, he, and so he wanted something good and salty at night to replace his addiction of chips and salsa. So he started eating sunflower seeds. And first, you know, it started with just those little skinny bags that you can get at Quick Mart, you know. And then it went to like the kind of medium-sized bag. No, no, no. Now that man gets in bags that are about this big. 
And I wake up every single morning. Did y'all hear me? Every single morning to a pile of sunflower seeds that are like this on my end table. Do y'all know how disgusting it is to rake those things off of an end table that you know have been sitting in his mouth forever? Because he don't just break them open and do what, no, no. He has to throw them all in his mouth, suck the daylights out of them, and then crack them open. And he does it while you're talking to him on the phone. Oh my gosh, somebody shoot the man when he does that. I'm on the phone and I was like, ah, take them out of your mouth before I hurt somebody. Yeah. And then, you know, and now it's, they have taken over my home phone. It's, I don't know how, I love sunflowers and all. Y'all know that's my favorite flower. <laughs> Y'all know that. But I don't want them growing out of my couch. You know, I have seeds on my carpets. I have seeds in his truck. They're in my car. They're in his office here. They are even, we have a little room over here where we can stay when we stay all night down in town. And they're all over the carpet in his room there. They're all in his chair there. Like sunflower seeds have taken over our life. I don't even know how, but they ended up in my bed. He don't even eat them in the bed, but they ended up in my bed. Like sunflower seeds have taken over our world. The man needs an intervention. I'm just telling y'all, the man needs an intervention for sunflower seeds. The truth of it is, is that every single one of us has something in our life that we struggle with, right? Every one of us, I don't care who you are. There's something in our life that we all struggle with. First Peter 2 and 19, can you read it with me? Ready, set, go. For a man is a slave to whatever controls him. Today, I want to talk to you about what the Bible says of how we can break free from the habits and the addictions and the compulsions. Pa last week, Pastor Guy told us that lasting change happens from the inside out. And so today I want to build on that and using the acrostic of the word break free, I want to give you this, the spiritual and emotional and mental elements for breaking free from our addictions. By the way, since there's nine points today, next week when James speaks, there will be no points. <laughs> no. Ta-da. Yeah. That'll, that'll sink in later when y'all go home. Okay. How do we break free? The first thing is begin today. Begin today. Begin today. Have you ever noticed, <laughs> my hand is raised, that more people are going on a diet tomorrow than they are today. You know, you're going to have that last dessert tonight so that you can start your diet tomorrow. Yeah, I'm not the only one. I know that y'all are acting like y'all ain't on this and y'all know y'all are with me. Yeah, yeah. We're, we all do that, don't we? We put off today for today what we, we want to try and do tomorrow. Ecclesiastes said, if you wait for perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. You have to do it now. It's going to be harder to change tomorrow than it is today. You know why? Because it gets worse over time. Because delay only makes the problems worse. I promise you, if I went on my diet three months ago when I said I was going to, I wouldn't have as much weight to lose as I do right now. Yeah, because if you don't change those habits, it gets worse, not better. By the way, this message is just as so much to me today as it is from y'all. As I was writing this out, I was saying, ouch, continually, okay? The R is refuse to blame others. We have to refuse to blame others. The problem is as old as Adam and Eve. Adam sinned, and he blamed his wife. Eve sinned, and she blamed the snake. And we've been blaming each other ever since. And the snake didn't have a leg to stand on. Yeah. It's never going to get better until we take responsibility for our own actions. We have to take responsibility. Proverbs 19 says, some people ruin their lives by their own stupid actions. I hate this scripture. How about y'all? By their own stupid actions, and then they blame the Lord. I want to ask you a question. Who are you blaming for your mistakes, for your addictions, for your problems? God, the devil. The devil made me do it. It's him. Your parents, your peers your partners, your spouse, your kids, who are you blaming? How do you spell blame? B-L-A-M-E, be lame. <laughs> we are being lame when we blame other people. The E is examine my life. We have to examine our own life. I have to take a personal inventory, a frank evaluation, and ask myself, what are my weaknesses? What are the areas that are out of control? What am I addicted to? Now, in this process, it's going to take the Holy Spirit and some very trusted friends. Why? Because we're pretty good at denial. <laughs> in fact, some of us have a river named after us, like I said, because we have been in denial so long. We, we don't like to look at the truth. And so you have to have trusted friends. 
The Bible says blessed are the wounds of a friend. In other words, the ones that tell are honest with you and that help you to look at a situation honestly and be honest with you about it. We have to help because denial is always preventing healing. It keeps us from really examining our heart and our life and being honest with ourselves. Years ago, James wrote a song called Breaking Free. And it was when me and him was really learned to come out of that whole religious system because we were pastors, we were taught that you, you, had, you had to hide everything. You couldn't let people know where you were really going through. And it nearly killed us, it nearly killed our marriage, it nearly killed everything around, I mean, our whole life. Because we felt like we had to hide everything and we were dying inside. But when we came out of hiding and we went, no, 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 we can't survive like this, we're not gonna make it. And we let everybody know, guess what? We're human just like you're human. We have mistakes just like you make mistakes. We have hangups just like you have hangups. And what began to happen was this revolution of people in our church becoming real and getting honest about where they're at. And so that is why this place is known as a place that you can be real. You can be honest. You can talk about your hangups, the things that you're going through. Why? Because we had to start. We know it, it, it starts at the head. And if we're honest and we're real with you guys, then it's going to help you to be real and to be honest with each other. That's how it happens. And James wrote this song. It's called Breaking Free. I want to read you the lyrics. It said, I tried so hard to change on my own. Didn't tell anyone I didn't want it known. I'd go to church and wear a plastic smile while all along I'm in denial, surrounded by people, yet sitting all alone. Then one day my heart began to see the light when someone told me that God could make it right. If I'd confess to a trusted friend and pray to God, health would begin. I'd have someone to help me in the fight. I'm breaking free from the chains that have bound me. I'm breaking free from the prison that surrounded me. It's the truth I believe that brings freedom I receive. By his grace, I can say I'm breaking free. That's what it's all about. The bridge goes on to say, I'm taking off my mask. I'm getting real, confessing to God and friends so I can heal. That's what it's all about. Psalm says, when I refused to confess my friends, I was weak and miserable and I groaned all day long. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide them and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. We must get honest before God. We have to do an, it's not like a one-time evaluation. It's a constant evaluation. Every single week, I try to sit down and write out, God, help me examine my heart. I, I say Psalms, it's talking about like, a, I, help me to be an open book before you. And I think sometimes we're real easy to slam that book shut and say, no, 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 God, just the cover looks great. Let's not pay attention to what's inside, right? That's how I do anyway. And I pray all the time, God, help me to open that book. Help you. I want you to read the pages of my life. It's not like you don't know, God, but help me to know what's going on in my heart and in my life. Help me to be an honest evaluation constantly in my life of what's going on and help me break free of those things that are holding me back. The A is ask Christ to take over my life. Ask Christ to take over my life. You are going to need a power greater than yourself to accomplish these things in your life. Did you know that? You cannot do it in your own power. Some of you have tried and you have failed repeatedly over and over the same as I have. When I try to do it in my own power and my own strength and I don't give it over to God, I fail every single time miserably. And I always make the situation worse. We have to have a power higher than ourselves. So one, I go to the best power of all and that is Jesus Christ. He is the only one who can ever help you. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And he is the ultimate power that can help you. Romans 6 says, do not let sin control your puny bodies any longer. I love that. Do not give in to its sinful desires, but give yourself completely to God, every part of you to be used for his good purpose. He's saying the solution to your addiction is to get the right master on your side. Every day we're going to be controlled by something, every single day of our lives. So what are we going to be controlled by? Other people, food, TV, sex, drugs, rock and roll, all of that? No, why not choose the right master and why not let it be Jesus? Freedom takes place when I say I'm not going to let any other thing control me. I'm going to let Jesus, the king, control me. Which leads us to the K, is keep away from temptation. This is a big one. You have to keep away from temptation. Romans 13 says, don't practice in wild, or participate in wild parties and getting drunk or in adultery, in immoral living or in fighting and jealousy, but let the Lord Jesus Christ take control of you and don't think of ways to indulge your evil desires. Let the Lord Jesus Christ take control of you and don't put yourself in tempting situations. 
For example, if you have a problem with drinking, you don't stock the bar in your home. You don't make a bar in your home. If you have a problem with lust, you need to stay away from the internet and things that's going to cause you to do that very thing. If you're overeating, you don't stop pile your home with dwarves, chews, and all of those things that will cause you to sin. No. Or hamburger that you make a big juicy cheeseburger out of. You don't. That was funnier than that. A key to overcoming temptation in your life is you have to think in advance what you're going to do. You have to make a plan. You have to make a plan. Teenagers, you don't wait until you're in the back seat of the car to decide if you're going to keep your body pure before God. You better plan in advance because you're going to be led by your plans or by your glands, <laughs> one or the other. And if you're already in the back seat of the car, I promise you it's going to be your glands that you're led by. No, no, no. You have to make a plan beforehand. Did you know that one out of every four who visit a pornographic sign is a woman? Only one out of four. But did you know that four out of five who visit chat rooms are women? Men are visual, women are intuitive. 90% of, of everyone that says the internet activity has negative effects on their marriage or on their relationship. 90% of every human says that will admit it. 90% said it has a negative effect. 86 to 90% of men who visit porn sites admit it lowers the self-esteem of their partner and causes increased depression and anxiety in their own lives. We have to make a plan. So if you're going to stay pure, you have to make a plan. You have to get accountability software on all your devices. You have to have a few close accountability partners that when you're going through a time of temptation, you can call somebody that can hold you accountable and help you and pray you through that time of temptation. Some of you may need to go off all social media, especially if you like the chat thing. You need to go off all social media. Can I tell you, uh, my son, Jonathan, I'm not telling you anything that he wouldn't tell you. He gives his testimony all the time. He was addicted to porn. And he got off of all social media because there were things constantly coming across the screen that would cause him to fall. And for over three or four years of his life, he had no social media whatsoever. And when he went back on social media simply to promote what he, where he's going to be singing and stuff on the weekends and, and what he's doing, his wife has complete accountability over all of that. He has her watch all of his sites. Why? Because he said, Mom, I don't ever want to go there again because I do not want to destroy my family and destroy my own life. And most importantly is I do not want to destroy my relationship with God. And so you have to do something. You have to make yourself accountable. And you have to make the decisions beforehand. Do whatever it takes to keep away from temptation. You can't wait till you're in the middle of it to make that decision. Now, that was the break part. But now let me tell you how to get free, okay? That's breaking it off of you. How you totally get free is the focus on something better. Focus on something better. Pastor Guy talked about this last week. You have to change the channel of your mind. You have to completely refocus it. The Bible says that the spiritual battle is fought in the mind. It's in the mind. And if you want to change your life, then you have to change your mind. Whatever captures my attention captures me. Whatever captures my attention is going to capture me. So I have to change the focus of my mind. If I go into sweet surrender just to look at the clothes and the household stuff that's in there... I promise you, I am coming out with one of their yummy pieces of homemade German chocolate cake, the same as my grandmother used to make. And I'm going to get a spoon on my way out because I'm going to eat that sucker the minute I hit the seat in my car. Yeah, it's going to be going down because it's got coconut and pecans and all that yummy stuff in the icing. I mean, it's like old-timey German chocolate cake. It's the best. In fact, last week, I went in there just because I wanted to do something nice for our worship team. I wanted to get them cupcakes. Yeah, what do y'all think I came out of there with? I came out of there with a German chocolate cake just for me. And then I bring it to our worship team. In all seriousness, do y'all know that our worship team gets here every Thursday night at 630 and they practice for at least an hour. And then they get here at 7.15 every Sunday morning. And they are here till 1.30, 2 o'clock every Sunday afternoon. And that's volunteers. Can we give them a hand? Yeah. They're amazing. They are amazing. No, but you have to make a plan. The key is you can't just resist temptation. It's not to resist it. It's to literally change the channel of your mind. Refocus yourself on something else. That's why I don't go to sweet surrender, surrender very often. <laughs> I allow myself about every three to six months to go, and that's it. Why? Because I know I am giving in to temptation. Yeah, you have to be smart. You have to know what you're going to do. So what should you focus on? 
Philippians 4 and 8 says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, let me say one more thing as I close this letter. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right. Think about things that are pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and praiseworthy. And I promise you that German chocolate cake is praiseworthy. But just, I'm not just saying. But no, it's called the replacement principle. You have to replace the bad with the good. As Pastor Guy said last week, you must take the lies and replace them with the truth. Jesus said you will know the truth and what? The truth will set you free. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You have to know what the truth is, replace that lie with the truth, and then God can set you free. This is so true in every single area of our life. By the way, if you weren't here last week for Pastor Guy's message, you have to get that. Because I'm telling you, it will change your life. It really is one of these messages building on another, but that one was so very important because you have to change the channel of your mind, change the way you think. We must take the lies that we believe about our addictions and replace them with the truth. When the devil puts in your mind the lie that, oh, it'll be fun to go out there and get drunk with all of my friends, it's gonna be fun. Hey, it's gonna be fun for a little while, but it ain't gonna be so fun when you're hugging that toilet calling for your mama. No, 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 that ain't fun. Or when the next morning your head feels like it weighs 100 pounds. That ain't fun. I'm sorry, guys, that ain't fun. It's only fun for a minute. No, but the Bible says don't get drunk but with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Don't get drunk, be filled with the Spirit instead. Make the decision beforehand. Replace the lie with the truth. Oh, it'll be a rush to have an affair with that cute thing that I'm working with or that handsome dude that's back there. No, 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 it's gonna be fun. It'll fill, fulfill all of my fantasies. Replace that lie with the truth. Yeah, it might be exhilarating for the moment, but turning my back on my God or my wife or my husband or my kids, my family, no, 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 it does more damage and causes more pain than is beyond belief. Anybody that's ever been through it will tell you that. It causes all kinds of pains. And did you know that over 70% of marriages that are a result of an affair end in divorce? Over 70%. And only five to 6% of those ever lead in to marriage. So you're gonna blow up your life and your relationships and everything else and do damage to the ones around you. And you're, it's, it's not going to bring fulfillment into your life. You may think, oh, it's going to be amazing to go to bed, some of you single ones, with that hot stuff I'm going on a date with tonight. But when you're giving away a piece of your soul, because did you know that's literally what it is? Sex is not casual. The world wants us to believe that sex is casual. I'm here to tell you right now, sex is not casual. Jesus Christ, God himself, made sex to be something beautiful to be shared between a husband and wife. Why? Because you literally tie your soul to somebody. So all of those people that you have casual sex with, you are tying a part of yourself to them. And before long, you find yourself empty and hollow and nothing left to give. Why? Because you've given yourself out. You've given pieces of yourself out. And you have to pray to God and ask him to help break those soul ties that you have formed in your life so that your your soul can be fulfilled once again. It's not a casual act. It's a very important thing. God made us to truly be united in heart and soul in that sexual act. Sex is a beautiful thing, beautiful thing when it's done in the right way. God meant it for us to tie our souls together. It's the most beautiful bonding thing that can happen between a husband and a wife. Do you know also that when you go into a sexual relationship with somebody, you are no longer, when you're outside of marriage, you are no longer getting to know them intellectually. Now your body has a desire and that that desire is gonna be fulfilled. And you quit learning about them intellectually. Things that would trigger you before, and you'd say, oh, no, 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 uh, I better watch that. Uh, that, That's kind of a, you know, one of those signs that, no, that might not be the right person. When you're just getting to know them intellectually, you're gonna pay attention to that sign. But when you've already tied yourself to them with your body, you're gonna ignore those signs. Because now your body is craving something. So let's make a decision beforehand that we're going to honor God with our body and we're going to wait for marriage. You may think that that meth or that cocaine or that reefer or whatever it may be is going to take your pain away. That you'll be happier. But replace the lie with the truth. That yeah, it may take your pain away for a moment. But the pain is going to come back with a vengeance. And it's only going to destroy your life. Give your life to Jesus and allow him to be the drug of your life. Because there's nothing like him. And the R is restore broken relationships. Restore broken relationships. You may say, Lydia, what has that got to do with anything? Because with any of us, when we go through addictions, we destroy relationships around us. We do damage to the relationships around us. One of my addictions that I have to stay accountable on all the time, honesty, is overspending. I love to spend money. (laughs) I do. And 
I don't, I, I stay super accountable with, my, with a credit, we have one credit card, that's it. And we stay super accountable. Why? Because I know that I may think, oh, it's not harming anybody, but yes it is. It's harming my future. It's harming how I can help people. It's harming how I can give. It's harming how I can do for my grandchildren. I want to help them go to college. I want to be a part of that and in investing into their future. I want to be able to help my parents as they're aging. I want to be a part of their lives and helping them. I want to be a part of those things, but I can't do that if I spend out of control. No, no, I have to have accountability in my life, and I know that because that is my weakness. And so I have to keep accountability. Do I like it? Nope, but I can tell you this, it sure brings satisfaction in my life when I stay accountable because it, it helps me to know and be able to give to people when God tells me to. Otherwise, I'm stretching myself too thin and it's not fair to anybody, much less me or my partner, my husband. We have to ask, what are the addictions that we have manipulated other people with to feel, fulfill those addictions? And in that, we end up causing grief and, and guilt to ourselves. And we have to go back and do our best to make restitutions in those relationships. Romans 12 says, as, for, as, for, as far as your responsibility goes, live at peace with everyone. It means you take the initiative. You make the list. You go to them. You ask for forgiveness. You ask for restitution. You offer it. And whenever there's been an offense, you do your best to make it right. Because a clear conscience is essential for the change to happen in your life. And the E is enlist a support group. The first E is enlist a support group. We all need friends who are going to care for, pray for, and encourage and keep us on track. Every single one of us. If we don't have that, we're toast. James says, therefore, conf confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Did you get that? We need each other. I just told my women's Bible study this Wednesday night. We cannot do life alone. God did not make us. The Bible said it was not good, that God saw it was not good for Adam to be alone. It is not good for us to be alone. We need each other. If one can put 1,000 to flight, the Bible says two can put 10,000 to flight. Do the math. That's saying, God, we cannot do life alone. We need other people who will be around us and help us to overcome those things. One of the best healing ministries we have that help in that area is a ministry we have here called PTO, Peel the Onion. You may say, what in the world does that mean? It means the things in our life are like peeling a layer of the onion at a time. As God heals us, it's like peeling off those layers and God is helping us to get to the center, to the core of what is going on in our lives as we peel off those layers. And there's a, a lady in our church named Marjorie who wrote out her testimony and said we could share it. And I want you to read this. You talk about a raw and real testimony. I love how honest she is in this. Before PTO, I thought I was unworthy to hear God. I was too tainted, too much of a sinner to hear the Lord's voice. I would come to church and serve, and yet I didn't feel worthy enough for God's grace and felt too shameful to have friends who would accept me for me. I was raised to believe that my worth could only be found through a man and was reminded by others of how sinful I was for God's grace. I would chase men with no desire to commit. The more men I had, the more worthy I felt, but still it made me feel so alone and so dirty. I had no heart when it came to relationships, but two months in PTO and the chains of my guilt and shame are almost completely gone. Because of the women of PTO and my sponsor, I have finally found the words fed to me that were a lie. My worth does not depend on a man, and my sins are not too ugly for God to forgive. Two months in PTO, and at the age of 43, I have finally learned to listen to God, and a miracle has begun to happen in me. I was given the gift of a man, a man that I am only dating. I am not having to lay with him to realize that I am no longer a whore, but I am a woman. Girlfriends who were so hard for me to keep, but since PTO, I have gained more friends. I have gained nine sisters who are proud to be seen with me outside of the church walls. And two months in, and I've already found life and truth. That's what it's all about. That's what it's about, to find healing in our lives, to get rid of those old identities that the enemy has tried to put on us. You are not who the enemy says you are. You need to hear me. You are not who the enemy says you are. You are God's beloved. You are his child, and you are worthy because of the blood of Jesus Christ. You are worthy of his love and his grace and his forgiveness. Listen to the voice of God and listen to the identity that he has on you, not the lies that people have spoken over you all of your life that the enemy has spoke over you and used people to do it which leads us to the next one 
extend myself to others. It's exactly what Marjorie just did. She extended herself to the, the people in this room today, saying, look, if God did it for me, he can do it for you. It doesn't matter where you're at. It doesn't matter what you're going through. God loves you, and he wants to heal you. He wants to bring wholeness to your life and fulfillment to your life and, and self-worth to your life, to get rid of all of the things that are messing you up. See, because God never wastes a hurt. I love my sweet little mother-in-law. She makes the statement all the time, your mess will become your message. Your mess in your life will become your message. God never wastes a hurt. He never heals me just for my sake. He heals me so that I can help somebody else. Why can me and James help people when it comes to relationships and especially the marriage relationship? Because our marriage was a disaster. There was infidelity. There was all kinds of things. If you're talking about being incompatible, there ain't no two people in the world more incompatible than me and him. And we had all kinds of things going on in the early years of our relationship and then throughout of our relationship when it came to incompatibility. We were at odds all the time but through the grace of God and making ourselves accountable to somebody else and going through and carrying through with the things the commitments we made I can tell you right now and stand before you the man is my very best friend he is I love him and I want to grow old with him I am growing old with him I'm almost 60 but I'm telling you that is a miracle in itself. If I told you all the things we went through, you would say that is a miracle in itself. So how can I help you? Because I've been there. I've done that. How can I help you when it comes to the relationship of your kids? Because I've had to go through things with my kids. And God has healed and restored relationships. That's what it's all about. So the only way I can help you when we talk about these things, it's like you're out there and you're drowning and I'm throwing out a lifeline to you and saying, come on, you can do it. How do I know? Because I've done it myself. I'm not going to tell you that you're not going to get wet. I'm not going to tell you that there's times your head is not going to go under. I'm not going to tell you that there's moments you're not going to feel like you can't make it. But when you listen and you reach out to God and allow that lifeline to bring you in, God is going to heal your life. He's going to restore your life and he's going to bring you back to a place of hope and of safety and a security and new life if there's anything I want us to be known as may we be known as a church where people can come and be real and say this is my hang up this is what I'm going through and watch Jesus Christ restore their life it is who we are it's in our DNA it's what's happened in mine and James's life so there has no hope but to be our DNA but it was long before me and James 80 years ago it was prophesied over this church that we would be a healing hospital that we be a life a lighthouse to those who are seeking and going under and may we be their life preserver may we share our story and tell them that there is hope extend yourself give yourself to others and watch what God is going to do in their lives and in your lives through it let's pray thank you Jesus thank you Jesus let's pray together Oh, Jesus. I want to just pause, Jesus, and say thank you. Oh, Abba God, we could not be anything that we are without you. You have so restored our lives. You heal the broken areas of our life. God, you are continuing still to work on me, to heal broken areas of my life, things that I struggle with every day. And God, may the people sitting here today find hope in you because you are the hope for this world you are the only hope for this world god may we know who we are through your voice speaking to our ear no longer believing the lies of the enemy do away with those lies god for every person sitting here today that is struggling that is struggling god may they hear your voice through me today <laughs> in jesus will break those things off your life where there is no hope God will restore hope God in the areas of their life where they feel like they're drowning God may today may today they feel like they've got a life preserver for our God bringing them in keeping their head afloat and God that life preserver is you is what you can do in our lives restore hope Restore hope. Restore vision. Restore identities, God. Who they are in you. Thank you, Jesus. If you're here today, 
you've never accepted Jesus as your King, as your Lord. I want to ask you today if you want to do that, because that is your only hope. That is where true change comes from. It's through giving your heart and your life to Him and saying, I don't want you just as a friend. No, I want you as King, because this is a kingdom, not a democracy. He's not a president, He's a King. He's a King. And when you listen to him and you listen to his voice and you begin to go by his ways, your life will change. He will change you. And if that's you today, I want you simply to slip up your hand. We're all going to say a prayer with you throughout this building. But I just want to know who's praying with me. Nobody else looking around. Will you just one, two, three, slip your hand up. Ready, set, go. Yeah. Right, lift that all the way across this building. I need Jesus. I admit today I need Jesus to be king of my life. Yes. I see all of those hands. New Life, let's say this prayer together with those coming to Christ today. Dear God, I cannot do life on my own anymore. I can't make the changes that I need to make without you in my life. So right now, I ask you, Jesus Christ, to become my rescuer, my king. I want to serve you because I know that you are love. And everything that you want me to do is for my good. I turn my life over to your care and your control. Thank you for forgiving my sins and for giving me eternal life. In your powerful name I pray. Amen. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done right now. Man. Man.